Okay, everybody, we'll get started now. So, with this song and prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you now, this, the day of atonement, Sabbath day of rest. Thank you for your grace and your mercies, and we come to plunge in the fountain and be washed in the flow that flows from Calvary's mountain. Songwriter said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood to lose all their guilt stains. So we come seeking your face that we might lose all our guilty stains and start a new life, a new life with you in Jesus Christ. We invite your presence into this meeting now and may you attend us with your grace and open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from your sacred page. We ask for your cleansing, your healing, and your transforming grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Sabbath greetings, everyone. This is the Day of Atonement Sabbath, October 10th, October 9th, rather, 2019. It is the 10th day of the seventh biblical month. 175 years ago, when our church movement began, officially, really, theologically speaking, not from any type of legislative or business dealing but in heaven's eyes when this movement began in 1844 it was around the question of october 22nd and there are today many adventists who do not know and many adventists of various stripes uh, no matter which stripe have a question regarding october 22nd when asked 
How do you know that October 22nd was the Day of Atonement for 1844? We can turn to Sister White, or for some people, Victor Huddiff's writings, and say, here, the answer is easy. It's written down right here. But if someone said, well, on this calendar, I noticed that on the calendar it says that the Day of Atonement in 1844, even that the Jewish people kept, was on September 23rd. Why is it that you're so late? Your system is a sham. It's built in a hoax. It's built in a, a fake story. And then it becomes a point of great concern. And we have seen the stories and heard the stories of um, various ones in our denomination who have given up on 1844 because they consider it a hoax. So the question is, 1844 a hoax? I venture to say no, it is not. And so the purpose for the study and the title of it is Demystifying October 22nd, 1844. So we want to give every man a biblical answer. And 1844 requires, it demands a biblical answer. Here's the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So every man needs an answer. Every honest question requires an honest answer. And so the Bible requires of us to sanctify the Lord and be ready, be equipped so that we can provide the authorized answer from God's word. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. We will come from time to time across different chasms and meet different people, and they will have questions for us. I remember a few years ago, there was a Jewish man who had questions for us. We had to provide answers that were not from the New Testament. And uh, I posted some of those discourses. Um, here the Bible says, uh, from not, not from the New Testament because he was Jewish. So he needed to see how the Old Testament validated this claim. Had another experience when I met a Jewish woman and shared with her the truth of the 2003. She was adamantly opposed to anything Christian. She's a Seventh-day Adventist today, baptized. I was there at her baptism. She took Bible classes with me. And she, I remember when we went through the 2300-day prophecy, she said, you mean to tell me that I've been deceived by my rabbis? As her parents would have nothing to do with Adventists. And so she grew up very hostile to Sabbath keepers who were not of a Jew, Jewish you know, synagogue. So um, to God be the glory for that. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 to 26, the Bible further instructs, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So God is requiring of us to be able to instruct those who oppose themselves against the truth. So we have to be patient, meek, apt to teach, and not striving over foolish and unlearned questions. People will ask questions even after the answer has been given. But when you're clear in your heart with the Holy Spirit that the answer has been provided with clarity, then the story is over. It is now a browbeating session, and you no longer have an obligation to continue with foolish and unlearned questions. 
in college they say there are no foolish questions or there are no stupid questions. Well, the Apostle Paul doesn't agree with that. He speaks of some questions that are unlearned and foolish. And we're not going to chastise anyone for being foolish, but we want to be able to instruct all and who oppose themselves with the truth. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21, 22. More assurances here. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare us things for to come. So God wants, warns again that we are to depend on the former things, the types in his word, so that they can guide us to the antitypes, the end of the things that are to come upon the earth. And this is the profound truth. The law of types and symbols God has left in his word as guidelines for us. Finally, Isaiah. And this is a big one. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. And most of us as Adventists hold this passage dear. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, very interestingly, um, most of us as Adventists, when we say the law and the te- when we say the testimony, we believe it's Sister White's writings, and when we say the law, we mean it's the Ten Commandments. But in this study, we are going to broaden that understanding. Notice carefully, though, what the Bible says: if they speak not according to this word. So the law and the testimony are reduced to this word. Not these words, but this word. What, therefore, is the law and the testimony? Because it's important. In Exodus chapter 25, Exodus 25, verses 16 21 and 22, we'll read concerning the testimony. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. 22, and there I will meet with thee, And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So here we have the ark of the testimony. And this testimony is placed within the bosom of this ark. And so here I have on the right... You see the Ark of the Covenant, above which lays the mercy seat with the two cherubim's outstretched wings. And inside this chest, the testimony, we have the pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded. And that happens to be the shepherd's rod, really, that um, God had provided them. And... We had the table, the two tables of the testimony. And that testimony is the ten, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. So no need to be shocked here, but in Isaiah's day, they had to prove things to the law and to the testimony, and they didn't have Sister White around. So they had to, their understanding of the testimony It's quite different from ours today. Here, Exodus 31, verse 18. And he, God, gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. We find again that the testimony represents the Torah, the, the 
not the Torah, but the the um, Decalogue, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Again, we read in Exodus 25, verse 15 here, or rather, Exodus 32, verse 15, rather. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. So here again we have evidence from Scripture. It's too many instances in Scripture where the Decalogue is referred to as the testimony. David sang about it. You read in Psalms 19 and Psalms 119 where he has been very prolific on this topic. So this this is just a, a glancing view of the testimony being the commandments of God, the law of God. That's why it says, according to this word, if they speak not according to this word. So his law really are his testimonies, and his testimonies are his law. It is the truth. In Deuteronomy 4, verse 44 and 45, and this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel, These are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which Moses spake unto the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt. So when we talk about to the law and to the testimony, it's the precepts that God had already handed down. The code of law, the Torah. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Light meaning the light of truth. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 17, Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his testimonies, and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. So you see, the commandments and the testimonies and the statutes are linked. They're linked. Psalms 25, verse 10, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. So I have it here. His law plus his testimonies equals his truth. All the paths of Yahweh are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. You want to discover truth? Dig up into God's covenant his testimonies, and get familiar with them and start obeying them. And he's going to open our eyes. And we're told by Sister White's writings that there's much light to shine forth from the Jewish economy. And they're locked up in these testimonies. Psalms 119, verse 142 and 151. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Thy law is the truth. 151, thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Because thy law, thy commandments, those are the truth. It's very important for, and so, uh, I'll conclude this part with Psalms 119, this portion of the Psalms is called Beth, or you know, the house. Uh, verses 9 through 15, Psalms 119, 9 through 15, speaking of the purity and the holiness of God's law, his testimonies. And the writer says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all thy judgments, the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies. As much as in all riches, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. So in totality, the testimonies are the word of God. Now certainly, 
in, later in time. The testimonies include the writings of the prophets. And so we realize in Revelation 19.10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The part we're emphasizing today, or, and the spirit of prophecy really means the spirit in the prophets. The spirit of prophecy is not a person. It's the spirit to prophesy. The spirit that is invested in the prophets, who spoke not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the, the spirit of prophecy was in Moses too as he received the testimony from the Lord. So the question we have in front of us is the Seventh-day Adventist judgment our message in jeopardy? Is our message in jeopardy? We have internal conflicts and external ones from those who look on our message and they're looking for a way of challenging it. And there are some very good challengers out there. They have taken credit for taking out Oh, and this person I'm going to read from, he has taken credit for leading 1.5 million Adventists out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church over a five-year period. He testified 300,000 per year. It's on his website. We, Dirk Anderson is his name, we have successfully moored or lured out of the church, Anderson speaks, 1.5 million, and he provided the statistics for it. So the Bible says we should be ready to give every man an answer, even those who oppose themselves against the truth. So we want to look in this judgment, our message, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, as well as in Daniel 7, 9 and 10, and look into what is at stake. As today being the day of atonement, the day of judgment, every Seventh-day Adventist should be aware of this date. But even in, you know, a commemorative sense, church, the church is meeting at Miller's Villa in New York, and they're going to have a big eating festival and just a dramatization of what went on 175 years ago not realizing that the Day of Judgment and the Day of Atonement is today. And that's a very sad place to be because we have not progressed with light. So here, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. That means the day of atonement has arrived. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the question is, how can we effectively declare the judgment hour message and do not know when the judgment hour is? Can't locate it on God's calendar. It is very necessary for us to be able to identify, to be able to locate, God's judgment hour on his calendar. In 1844, the pioneers were able to and had our people continued to walk in the light, we would not have stumbled to where we are today. And almost every group in the church, reform group and otherwise, and backslidden groups, are ch they are challenged with the question of 1844, October 22nd. Because outside of quoting from certain pioneers, we cannot validate from scripture, history, and um, calendar that this is so. That October 22nd was indeed the Day of Atonement on heaven's calendar. Daniel 8.14 says, and, on, and he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And Daniel continued in 7, verse 9 and 10, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. A fire stream issued and came forth from before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. And that he saw. So what's, there is now a serious question challenging this judgment, our message. Clearly from Scripture, there is 
to be a declaration of a judgment hour message. The sanctuary is to be cleansed. The prophecy declares that. We saw that the judgment is set. The ancient of days sits down and the books are opened. But now the question is, you gave us a date that seems invalid. Even by those who you appeal to, the Karaite Jews, they protest and said, no, that's not our date. So let's hear from those who are exposing Adventist fables and questioning, is it truth or fables? This is uh, by Robert K. Saunders. He's the founder of Truth or Fables. And he denounces the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine as fables. So I'm going to read for the next four or five slides from Anderson's Saunders' works, rather, not Anderson, but Saunders. I'm going to read from Saunders' web page, and then we look to answering um, Robert Saunders. Here he says, The Karaite Jews has now confirmed that the Day of Atonement in 1844 was late September and not late October. Their research is presented further down in this topic, but first we need to preface why this is important. Why is the Karaite date of the Day of Atonement important? He questioned. Seventh-day Adventists claim that in 1844, a very small Jewish sect called the Karaites used a different calendar and thus celebrated the Day of Atonement, 10th of Tishri, on October 22nd, one month later than the rabbinical Orthodox Jews who did so on September 23rd. He continues, Thus, the entire Seventh-day Adventist teaching regarding the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, the investigative judgment, the great disappointment, and Jesus' entrance into the most holy place, hinges only on the words of their prophet, Ellen White, and on their claim, Karaites celebrated the Day of Atonement on October 22nd in 1844. If either of these assertions is incorrect, then Seventh-day Adventism is in serious theological trouble. How hard is it to prove that the Jews did not keep October 22nd as the Day of Atonement in 1844? Not hard at all. And if you notice earlier, he left a link. There's a link where it shows there, the Karaite Jews now confirm that the Day of Atonement in 1844 was in late September, and it was indeed on September 23rd, according to the calendar. And Saunders continues, the rabbinical day of atonement in 1844 is easy, uh, how is that, so it's easy maybe to find for anyone to prove or it should be too easy for anyone to prove. I see. He had a two there. I didn't notice before. The rabbinical day of atonement in 1844 is easy for anyone to prove from Jewish sources that it came on September 23rd, 1844. That's a death knell. It would seem. He went on, Samuel Snow was first to espouse the October 22nd, 1844 date and claimed that it was from the calendar of the Karaite Jews. Quotes, Snow, Samuel, a Congregationalist, then a skeptic, later a Millerite minister, initiator of the Seventh Month Movement. Beginning with an article written on February 16th, 1843, he emphasized the Day of Atonement of the Jewish Seventh Month Tisri, the Jewish Day of Atonement, as the true ending date of the prophetic 2300 years. Later, he set forth a specific day, the specific day of October 22, 1844, our calendar equivalent of the 10th day of the 7th month in that year, according to the old Karaite Jewish calendar. He's here quoting from the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia, Volume 10, page 1357. Saunders is a very well-schooled Seventh-day Adventist in, in church history. He knows church history quite well, and he's used this to great advantage against Adventists 
who are ignorant of church history. And so he's clear and correct that Samuel Snow had the, started the, the seventh month movement or came to that acknowledgement, that awareness, and passed it on. Sister White and everybody else accepted that. And they latched onto the date, October 22nd, 1844. But was Samuel Snow walking in thin ice or thin air? Or did he have biblical, biblical authority for that position? Saunders continues, Ellen G. White put her prophetic stamp of approval on the false Karaite date that S.S. S. Snow thought up. Ellen was not aware that the Karaite Day of Atonement was the same as the rabbinical date of September 23, 1844. And he quotes from Great Controversy now. The tenth day of the seventh month, the great day of atonement, the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which in the year 1844 fell on the 22nd day of October, or, or upon, fell upon 22nd of October, was regarded as the time of the Lord's coming. This was in harmony with the proofs already presented that the 2300 days would terminate in the autumn. The close of the 2300 days in the autumn of 1844 stand without impeachment. And so now he's going to make it impeachable. And he went on through the rest of his document to demonstrate. And if you were not grounded in church history, biblical knowledge, and calendar operations, you could easily be swept off your feet. But I praise God that he has given us a more sure word of prophecy and eyes in the midst of this darkness. So that's, um, oh, I see. I still have two more slides from Saunders. I thought I was finished. No, uh, I read that one before. Yeah, I was finished. So here, this is the sum total of the question surrounding October 22nd, 1844. And the, this top paragraph is worthy of looking, on, looking at once more. As he said, and I, I'll just state the last sentence, Ellen was not aware that the Karaite Day of Atonement was the same as the rabbinical date of September 23rd, 1844. That is a correct statement that the, the rabbinics and the Karaites jointly observed the Day of Atonement on, a, on September 23rd in 1844. And Saunders provided all the necessary proofs to sustain that view, uh, from archaeological views, uh, from tombstones and other things. They show that that was when they celebrated the Day of Atonement. So, oh, so yeah, this is still Saunders, I, I see. So Saunders continues, note, we would like to ask the Seventh-day Adventist researchers why they did not go to the Karaite Jews for documentation as we have done and as, we, and as was done by Ballinger in 1941. Could it be that they, didn't, they did and did not reveal their findings as it would nullify their prophet's dick? date you know jeering at seventh day adventists what an uncomfortable position to be in wow we were depending on the Karaites and they let us down and every time you hear 2300 days in 1844 in adventism you'll hear mention of Karaite jews and they let us down big time Karaites are not our friends on this topic here saunders continues e.s ballinger found the truth by a letter from the Karaite. The defenders of the creed declared that while the Orthodox Jews may have celebrated the Day of Atonement on September 23rd, the Karaite Jews observed it on October 22nd. We have made careful investigation and we find this, that this is a false claim. What a terrible thing. This is a false claim. The leading Karaite rabbi of Cairo, Egypt, Yosef Ibrahim Marzuk, in reply to an inquiry, inquiry as to the day on which they celebrated the atonement in 1844, wrote, 
As to the dates of the Passover and Yom Kippur, they are the following. According to the Karaite Jews, in the year 1843, the Yom Kippur is on Wednesday, the 4th October, and just the same date according to the Rabbinical. In the year 1844, it is on Monday, 23rd September, for the Karaite and Rabbinical. End of quote. This is from the gathering called by E.S. Ballinger, May-June edition of 1941. That's a very humbling position to be in, especially if your defense was simply to run after the Karaites and say, oh, the Karaites did so, and they were correct, and it's their calendar that we were using. And that's a big letdown. But hope is not lost. And God is going to vindicate his word. So we want to now look at what the Bible says on these things and provide every man an answer. Going back in Daniel 8, we looked in verse 13 earlier. I'll just read verse 14 for the interest of time because we have a few slides ahead. He said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now the term, the sanctuary be cleansed, or the cleansing of the sanctuary, is an event that occurred annually. It's once per year, on the tenth day of the seventh biblical month. And so it is essential for us to locate God's calendar in order to locate the month. You need to identify the first month so that you can find the seventh month. So the early Adventists had to be skilled in understanding the calendar. Not until they went into the calendar did they get the correct answer. See, we had been hoodwinked by the Roman Catholics for a very very long time. We, meaning Protestants, uh, Roman Catholics had taken away the, the Lord's calendar. In the point at times, as was discussed last night, Daniel 7.25, thought to change times and laws and really confused a lot of people. And so, by the time 1844 came around, people thought the sanctuary was the earth, the earth that was to be cleansed. Who thought about a sanctuary in, in heaven? Because the place of his sanctuary, meaning his Messiah's sanctuary, was cast down and placed to the earth. The, the power that is to oppress the people of God, the man of sin did that. And so masqueraded of himself, himself as a high priest. So then the earth was the sanctuary by all intents and purposes. Satanic delusion there. But this is what the devil did back then. And you know, not knowing of a sanctuary in heaven, and not knowing about the calendar either, they were now at the mercy of Catholic worldview, a Catholic worldview that led them farther away. And not until God stepped in and allowed Samuel Snow to come to the knowledge of the calendar did they rename and refocus themselves, and they were now known as a seventh-month movement. And you might want to do a little search on that to see the term seventh-month movement who it attributed to, and it, it was attributed to seven, the early Adventists, rather. Not Seventh-day Adventists, but the Adventists, because before we took on the name Seventh-day in the 1860s, we were just known as the, the Adventists. In Daniel 9, verse 24 and 25, it speaks of how to identify this period of time known as 2,300 days. Now, before I go farther, it is important to note another thing here that is typically not taught in our midst, in our, you know, with no matter which stripe of present truth uh, believers we, we embrace, you know, it is typically not recognized. But here, the Bible says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. These 2,300 days are 2,300 days of atonement. 2,300 days of atonement needed to be counted off. The 2,300th day of atonement is when the sanctuary in heaven 
would be cleansed. So there are many p- believers today who thought and think and teach that since 1844, time has frozen. The 2,300 days ended in 1844. What, about, what number would be 2,000? 301st day would be in 1845. We have stopped counting. Just because the prophecy says that on the 2300 days doesn't mean that the, the count is over. The count to the fulfillment of the cleansing has terminated. But time continues on. It's 2300 days of atonement that had to be checked off. It's so very important for us to come to that acknowledgement. And that's another reason why we know that the 2300 days are not as uh, some of the Protestant groups do, and they divide it up and get it 1150 days and all sorts of different permutations they use. It's 2300 evenings and mornings, a full day, because it's a day of atonement, a full 24-hour measure of time. On the 2,300 days, but these days are annual. They come once per year. So even if we didn't have Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, which says a day for a year, implicitly stated in the content of the passage here, we can validate that the 2,300 days are actually 2,300 years because these are annualized days. They come yearly. Cleansing of the sanctuary is an annual event. It's like if you said 2,300 birthdays, the person is not going to be, you know, I didn't do the math to see how many times 365 goes into 2,300, but it could be about six times. Yeah, and I can, 2,300 divided by 365, and that's six times. So it's not saying it's going to be an elapse of six years. No, because these are not contiguous. There are 2,300 days of cleansing the sanctuary, days of atonement. This is what is being taught here. And that's why on the 2300th one, the day of atonement commenced in heaven. So somebody had to go back and check off God's calendar of these days of atonement. How unfair it would be for God to dictate the understanding of a prophecy on an event that was nailed to the cross 1810 years earlier. Or actually, in this case, it would not even be 1810. It would be 1813 years earlier. How unfair would it be of the Creator If these days were done away with and nailed to the cross, why would God dictate the understanding of a prophecy with these days that were dead and gone? And we had to go scrape them up, otherwise we'd get it wrong. That would be so unfair. So this is another evidence to prove that these times were not thrown away. These appointed times were not nailed to the cross, as has been touted by so many across the Christian world. But as was discussed last night, and I'll tell you, when I first came to this knowledge back in 1990, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, I was reading Jen, reading Jen Markison's book, and I was so fed up with the little little book, but I didn't have anything else to read because every place he shows 666 belongs to the Pope. So I was at lunch reading, and every time he placed Daniel 725, Times and Laws, he placed it in uppercase. So I said, I paused. I said, hmm, I wonder what Times and Laws mean because they're pluralized. And so my first article, in, out of this research, I wrote an article entitled, He Shall Change Times and Laws, back in 1990. And that's been my genesis. When God, he gave a hunger and a thirst in my heart to find out the meaning of this pluralized term, times, plural, laws, plural. And that's when I knew, with concrete evidence, 
that the papacy tampered with more than just the Sabbath. But every, and they confessed. They removed every other Jewish festival from the Decalogue, from the, the Torah. That's another subject, but moving on here in Daniel 9, verse 24 and 25, because we want to locate 2,300. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, all of these are very important points. To seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the, unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And this word, the, should not be there, should be unto Messiah the Prince. So know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built in troublous times. So it is interesting that had the Jewish people brought an end to sins, brought an end to transgressions, and made reconciliation for iniquity, God would have brought in everlasting righteousness. The kingdom would have been realized back then. Everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision. The vision would not go beyond that. The 2300 days would have terminated. It would have truncated, rather. The vision would have been sealed up. The prophecy would not go on any further. And the Most Holy would have been anointed. See, this was what should have been. And Christ looked and, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them, that are sent unto thee. How often should I have gathered thee, as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Oh, if only you would know this day the things that belong unto your peace, but now they are not from henceforth. Jerusalem shall be surrounded with armies. You're going to destroy yourselves within. They're going to burn you down. You're going to eat your children. And it was a terrible sight that he saw. And he wept. Because the vision would not have terminated. He would have to run the full course. But so that even here we see the hope of the kingdom project, presented. That when the king came, had Israel conformed and brought an end to sins, then the most holy would have been anointed. Christ would have brought in everlasting righteousness. And certainly the gospel work would still need to be finished. But that the loud cry would have completed it all. The work would have been cut short in righteousness. The vision would have been sealed up. So, but 6,000 years will be our course. I won't get off on that part because there's a lot that could be said there. But um, the Bible says, from the time that the decree was issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, in verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, when was that commandment? And in our current Sabbath school lesson, the quarterly is going through um, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And that's very delightful. Because I looked to see if we were touching on the 2300 days, and maybe I didn't look closely enough, but I didn't see that. Uh, they did establish the year, the year 457, but I thought they would have taken farther. And maybe it's there, but I just didn't see it, um, as I wasn't searching as deeply as, I, as more time would have allowed. So here in Ezra, chapter 7, is where this decree is located. And we'll take verses 1 through 9 
you know, meandering through that chapter. And this was discussed in last week's lesson, actually, in the Sabbath school. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Shariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zodak, the son of Ahitub, Ahitub. This Ezra went up from Babylon. So Ezra came from a, a line of priests going all the way back to the days of Aaron. This same Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. And the Lord God of Israel had given him, and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Verse 7, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nephinims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And this is going to be repeated again. In the se- and this is key. In the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. This is Artaxerxes with a long hand. He had a very long, one of his hands was very long. He had a long reach. You hear of boxers and they have a long reach. This man had long arms. So he had a nickname called Longimanus, meaning long-handed. Uh, read that, uh, verse 7 again. And there went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Verse 8. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. So, King Artaxerxes is the key. We need to understand this king and his decree because it is this decree that will kick off the counting of 2,300 years or days of atonement. Notice that this was in the seventh year of the king. Now, important, important, there is a thing called the ascension year and the renal year. So the king will ascend to power, let's say Donald Trump, if he were a king, and he died, and Mike Pence, so he died this year, let's say any time before October, because in Hebrew thinking, the, the new year begins with the new month, and the new month, the, 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 the seventh month as it's the end of the, the old year and the beginning of the new, the end of the agricultural year. So uh, let's say, and let's not use Donald Trump because he's alive, but let's use a president that has died. John Kennedy, you know, he died and Gerald Ford, I think it was Gerald Ford who took over, or whichever president took over from Kennedy. And so he continued out the reign of Kennedy's, you know, tenure of Kennedy's reign. Now, it, it, let's say... And I don't remember when Kennedy died, but let's say it was June 5th of 1963. And um, in, in biblical speak, the, the year of his ascension would be the year when he takes power. But then the year of his true reign would begin the day of um, on the, the biblical new year. So the new president would have to wait until um, the seventh month before his reign, reignal year commences. So you have the ascension year when the, this power, this king rises to power, but he reigns from one new moon to another and from one new year to another new year. So this is what is going to happen. We're going to call upon Iran because remember all of this is going down in Iran, in Persia. And the Persians were very good at keeping records. You remember you had laws such as, as binding as the Medes and the Persians. And they, they kept fastidious records throughout all these years. So we'll look in some of their history as well. But it's important for us to at least appreciate um, what happened on the Day of Atonement, the typical Day of Atonement. In Leviticus, 20, in Leviticus 16, verse 29 to 34, Leviticus 16 29 to 34, this shall be a statute forever unto you 
that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And that's the reason why we take today off um, and use this equivalent as the weekly Sabbath. Verse 31. And it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls. That means fasting and prayer. Ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom ye, he shall anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in the father, his father's stead, shall make an atonement, and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and, for, and he shall make an atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Oh, see, this is the term once a year again tells us that the Day of Atonement is an annual event so if you're, or the Day of Cleansing. So if you're looking at 2,300 days of cleansing, then it's going to be 2,300 years. Very clear from Scripture here. So this day was for the priest, for the people, and for the sanctuary. Everybody must be cleansed. That was the day of ratification, the day to get at one with God, at oneness with our Maker, and start out in it with a new leaf, a new beginning, so that we can rejoice before him in the Feast of Tabernacles that would come up five days hence. Sister White, speaking of this, the antitypical day of judgment, she would make these statements. The books of record in heaven in which the names of, and the deeds of men are registered are to determine the decisions of the judgment. Says the prophet Daniel, the judgment was set and the books were opened. The revelator describing the same scene adds, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Revelation 12, verse 12. Now, Revelation 20, verse 12, rather. So here we find that there is to be a judgment in heaven. On par with the judgment that would have convened on earth. So when, they, when Christ you know, died and the veil of the temple rent in twain, the work of atonement no longer was... You know, conducted in the earthly sanctuary. But there had to be a cleansing place for sin. There had to be a washing place for sin, but under better set of ordinances with a different, with a higher blood, a, a, a better, you know, everything. And so um, Christ became the minister of that sanctuary. And um, the, this is where the new covenant comes in through the shedding of his blood. Ellen White continues. Next paragraph. There is a record also of the sins of men, for God shall bring every work into judgment, whether with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of in the day of judgment, says the Savior. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The secret purposes and motives appear in the unerring register, for God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Behold, it is written before me, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord. So our characters, our lives are bare before him with whom we have to do. And so every year there's a year of judgment, even since 1844. Every year there's a year of reckoning. The Day of Atonement was annual, and it remains to be annual. And as you know, was brought out last night, we have been led to believe that we are living in the great antitypical Day of Atonement, which is a long day from beginning 175 years ago, rather than an annual event. We won't dwell on that because we want to locate October 22nd, 1844. So then, um, going back to Ezra, 
yeah, I, I showed you the typical day of cleansing, the antitypical day of cleansing. Now we go back a little to the commandment that was issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem because we want to locate the day of atonement. Um, Verses 11 through 15. Now this is a copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, a scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time. I make a decree that all thy people, all, that all thy, they of thy people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and the gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. And then he continues. This is very important history, and that I'm, that's why I'm reading it here. Uh, reading it into the record for those who will see this presentation. Verse 16, And all the silver and the gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the freewill offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly to the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. So the king is here. He, no expenses were spared to, in this project. He didn't believe that God was one of the other gods. Some people want us to think that way. That, that's not the idea that God is projecting here. The king heard the voice of God. He felt the impress of the Holy Spirit, that, and he knew that this was his high calling. Now this king here, he had built a lot of temples in Babylon, uh, in, in Persia. He was not a Christian. He was not a Jewish king. He built a lot of temples, and he was not appeasing Yahweh. He knew that this was his obligation. See, God takes charge of the hearts of kings and rulers. We might not agree with their lifestyles and their practices, but God has everything under his control. And look at this. This is a heathen king giving such a righteous decree. You can imagine someone doing that today, and perhaps it would be, oh, that's a Jesuit. No, we have to see the hand of God when it's moving and not be able to see Jesuit in everything. But see the hand of God. Verse 17 says, That thou mayst buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, that do after the will of your God. The vessels also that are given thee from the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. And whatsoever more shall be needful, for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasury house. What a liberal use of state funds. You can imagine how that would be looked upon in our days. But then you look back in Egypt when Joseph was in Egypt. and you know How many of us would think well of Joseph when he had to walk with Pharaoh's ring and Pharaoh's helmet? You know how many people would say Joseph is now a Jesuit? You know, he had a crown that had a big viper, you know, projecting from it, and Pharaoh's ring. But God works with what he has to work with, and Joseph was not a traitor to the cause of righteousness. You know, Esther, she was in a compromised situation, and God worked with what he had to work with. She came to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we just need to see and understand when the hand of God is moving and troubling the waters. And be appreciative of that. Otherwise, we'll stand back and not realizing the movement, the divine movement that is happening in our very eyes, before our very eyes. So the king continued with his decree. Verse 21. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures, treasurers which are beyond the river that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of Yahweh, the God of heaven, shall require of you it be done speedily unto an hundred talents of silver and to an hundred measures of wheat and to an hundred baths of wine and to an hundred baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. No expense must be spared. 23. 
Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, Nephilims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, that means taxes, not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. So he removed all restraints that would even somehow shrink the, you know, their portion that they were given. You know, in this economy, everything you get, you have to pay taxes on. The it's a tax exempt here. There's a tax exemption. Everything that I've given to Ezra will go to Jerusalem. And the treasury knows it. The, the, you know, the, the Federal Reserve knows it. And it must be done with speed. And it was done with speed because God had, had a timetable. To, you know, the king's heart is in the hand of God. He turns it like water. Wherever he wants it to go, he does. And because I know that, it gives me such comfort that God is in control. And no matter how we see the world reeling and careening, God is in control. He controls even the heart of the most terrible despot. He controls, like, you know, the stern of, of the ship or the mass of the ship. He can turn that person with a server, he will. The last portion of this is in Ezra 7, 25 to 26. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, the king is still speaking, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whatsoever will... and Whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. imprisonment. This is a, a very powerful decree. This decree has been the recorded decree, and it's known you know, officially as the third decree and the decree that completed the building of Jerusalem and the walls and, you know, not just Jerusalem, the temple, but Jerusalem, the city. Sometimes people get this confused. Jerusalem has a temple there, you know, that was built, Ezra's temple, and, um, we call it the Zerubbabel's temple, but it's also Jerusalem as a city. It's a whole city that has its administration, you know, all the you know, state departments and everything else that makes the city operate. It's not just a church. So sometimes people mistake that and they go back to 538 B.C. to see when Cyrus's decree was issued, but that's not what is being discussed here. So let's keep moving on because we want to really get to see how we count. So when did Artaxerxes begin his reign? Uh, Artaxerxes, long-handed, long long-emanus. And uh, both Iran and Chuck Missler, Chuck Missler, this is a Sunday keeper, and so um, I, I could not find the encyclopedia, but I found it from his, his writing here, and it, it's very clear, and other encyclopedias support it. So that's why I gave him credit for for this encyclopedic ref reference, Britannica 1990 edition. It says, Artaxerxes Lonkimanos ascended to the throne of the Media Persian Empire in July of 465 BC. Don't forget that year and that month. Remember, July comes before the seventh month. And I'm going to show you the, the tabulation later. But so you, let's roughly say the seventh month is October. It comes between September and October. July is before September. It's before October, so that July would be his ascension year. He ascended to the throne in 465 B.C. So decrementing, you know, when you're going forward toward the New Testament, you're decrementing years. So the, in, at the new moon on, on the, tenth, the first day of the seventh month, that new moon, the trumpets, would also be the new year. And that would be the renal year of the king would begin. That would be 464 B.C. So he ascended to his throne in 465, but the renal year 
begins in 464. The Bible is very precise in this. Because let me go back here. It says that was in the seventh year. So here in Ezra 7, verses 7 and 8, it says, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. In verse 8, it was in the seventh year of the king. So very important to understand that we're dealing with the seventh year. This is a reignal year, not the ascension years, but the seventh reignal year. Here's Encyclopedia Iranica. This is from Iran, agreeing with what Missler has provided here. The exact month dates of all these events are not given. Artaxerxes' ascension year is generally thought to be the year 284 of the Babylonian Nabonazar era, beginning in December 465 BC. That is the fourth year of Olympiad 78. So he gave it a little further in as 465 BC, um, December. So you still had to get wait until 464 BC for his renal years to begin. So either one you're looking at July or December, you know, seven months apart, it wouldn't make a difference, but you're, you're still in 465. And you need to get to the new year, which begins in 464, for the, to begin counting the king's years of reigning. Hope that's clear. Here's Encyclopedia Iranica online. And speaking of Artaxerxes, they give us a little more. Actually, I, I guess in the, in the previous statement that was sufficient as well. But I'll take the second paragraph for time's sake. Artaxerxes I, a son of Xerxes I and Armistris, whose name Flavius Josephus, uh, gave as Cyrus, Persian king of 465-464 to 424-23 BC. Artaxerxes' ascension year is generally thought to be the year 284, and I just read that. So um, beginning in December of 465. So we have Iranica online, Encyclopedia Iranica, um, Encyclopedia Britannica, and other sources providing this bit of information for us. I'll just say Encyclopedia Iranica as well, uh, just to show you that they, they did a very detailed work on this, and I'll take a few uh, sentences from this portion. It says, under Artaxerxes I, the situation of the Jews in Israel considerably improved. The king appointed the Orthodox scribe Ezra as a sort of court official for Jewish affairs. In the seventh Renal year. This is so important. The seventh renal year, Ezra proceeded to Jerusalem with about 1,500 Jewish families of the exile community. So Iranians, the Encyclopedia Iranica, provides us with very precise uh, language here in the seventh renal year, just as we saw in the Bible in Ezra chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. And so they had it here, Ezra 7, 7 and following. Okay, so let's look in the renal versus the ascension years, because this is helping us in our study. Okay, so the ascension year is the year the king entered office, not the beginning of, his civil, not the, beginning of the civil year reign. The renal year is the first day of the first new moon year or the first new moon of the new year, when he went in office, beginning with the biblical new year, which we know to be Tisri, and so that's the seventh month, which falls between our modern September-October, as I stated before, in the Gregorian calendar. So here I have English names of the Hebrew months, and the number that they, they follow under, so Nisan is the first month, Ayar the second, Sivan the third, Tammuz the fourth, Av is the fifth, Elul the sixth, Tisri seventh, Sheshvan eighth. And so we don't need to go any further than this because we saw that the fifth month is one of those mentioned, uh, you know, that the king ascended to power at that time. Another one said it was December, but 
be that as it may, um, it wouldn't change the it wouldn't change enumeration here whatsoever. Tisri in green, that's the seventh month, and that's the month of great interest. So, just to show their equivalence, uh, Nisan is between March April of on the Gregorian calendar. Av is between July August, and Tisri is between September October. Gregorian equivalent. So as I shared with you earlier, the king ascended in the year 465 BC. And the ascension month is argued between December and January of 465 BC, noting that the Hebrew year begins in September, October. December or, December or July wouldn't change anything. We're still in 465, not because the year doesn't, didn't change in January as it does today. So I want to just focus on history. His ascension is renal year now. I have it here, renal. That's the first day of his, the renal year. is in the first day of the seventh month, history, in the year 464 B.C. Now let's look in these two parallel charts. So um, we're trying to find the, the seventh year. So we can use a calculator, calculator method, which I have on the left column here. And the calculator method, remember, the renal year, his ascension year is 465. So that's a zero. That doesn't have a count to it. Because he didn't start to reign until the first year of the first of the, the seventh of the first day of the seventh month, which was four sixty four. That's when four sixty four BC occurred. So we start counting from four sixty four BC and we count four sixty four to four sixty three. And so whole numbers you can see counting down from four sixty four you simply subtract um the seven years, you end up at 458. And so you have to wonder, why 458? Remember, you're dealing with years. Years. So 458 goes to 457. That's the calculator me method I showed you. But let's use the calendar method. The calendar method will allow you to see this more clearly. So... 7-1 on the right side here now, we have the renal year, the end, and the number. So from the Tisri the 1st of 464 to Tisri the 4th, 463, that's one year. 463 to 462, two years. 62 to 61, three years. 61 to 60, four years. 60 to 59, five years. 59 to 58, six years. 58 to 57, seven years. So in the year 457 BC is the year when the decree was made by Longinus for to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So I need to show you another error that many people are not careful with, and that is to cross the BCAD line. There's a right way and a wrong way to cross the BCAD line. And those of us who have studied, you know, elementary mathematics, you get to appreciate the number line and how it works. So the BCAD line operates at the number line. The only difference is that you cannot use a calculator. On, uh, if you use a calculator, you need to understand what is happening. Your calculator is calculating relative to zero. But time does not have a zero year. There is not a year zero. So watch the screen closely. I have some graphics that will appear on the screen um, in their respective orders. So first. It is wrong to assume that there's a ye zero year. There was not zero AD or zero BC. So that's why we're looking at the wrong way of crossing.
the BCAD line. So if you were, the question is, if you were born on April 1st of 3 BC, how old would you be on April 1st of 3 AD? If you plug it into your calculator, you're going to get it wrong. Because it's going to tell you that you'll be six years old. 3 BC to 3 AD, that makes it six. Not so fast. So, again, so let's see. We're going here from, in the, I don't know why three, I don't know why it didn't show up, but this is three here. Let me just try to write it in with my mouse. It's three, and this is two up here, and this is one. And I think it will come up shortly. Maybe I had the sequencing off. So this is, so you're going from 3 BC to 2 BC, that's one year, and 2 BC to 1 BC, that's two years, 1 BC to 0, to 0 BC, 0 AD, that's three years, then from 0 AD, that's how your calculator is doing it now, from 0 AD to 1 AD, that's four years, from 1 AD to 2 AD, that's five years, and from 2 AD to 3 AD, that would be six years. But as I said, this is the wrong way of crossing the BC AD line because there is no such a thing as a zero year. You would have gained a total of six as a person would be six years old at that point, but that would be wrong as stated before. So let's now look in the right way of crossing the BCAD line using the same example. So zero does not exist. There is no zero year. That's the first thing to be noted. As a result, then, we must add one year when calculating with a calculator or subtract one year, as in the previous example, you'd have to subtract one year. So the first would be from 3 BC to 2 BC. That's the elapse of one year. The person would be two years from 2 BC to 1 BC. You're two years. Now watch the leap. From 1 BC, you're going all the way over to 1 AD. And that, your calculator sees it as two. So you have to subtract one from it in order to get to the right point. The calculator sees it as two steps. I place add there, and I'll express, explain why I wrote add. You could use subtract, understanding whichever method you're using, you have to be consistent. So uh, the graphics here should be very clear to all that if you leapt from 1 BC, which is the equivalent of negative 1, all the way over to 1 AD, which is positive 1 in the number line, that would be two intervals. And so this is how your calculator sees it. And that's why when we use a calculator and try to calculate the 2300 days, we end up with 1843 and not 1844. So let me step back here a minute so we can see it again. So from 3 BC to 2 BC, that's one year. From 2 BC to 1 BC, that's two years. From 1 BC to 1 AD, that's three years. From 1 AD to 2 AD, that's four years. And from 4 AD to 5 AD, I'm sorry, from 2 AD to 3 AD, that would be five years. So if you were born in 3 BC, on April 1st, then on April 1st of 3 AD, you'd only be five years old, not six, as your calculator would incorrectly tell. So this is so um, important. As I note here, total age count is five years. This is, by, this is shortened by one. So you'd have to subtract one in this case in order to get to the right answer. All right, and I have the math works here, and uh, this should be pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll just go over it that you can appreciate it. In the, there are three columns for those who are not watching by screen. Um, the, 
the decree went forth in 457 BC. We give it a negative 457 if you're using your calculator. And the Jewish probationary time was 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, Daniel 9, 24 and 25. So 70 times 7, remember Jesus spoke about that, the close of probation. 70 times 7 is 490. And so we simply add 490, a positive 490, to the negative um, 457, and we end up at positive 33. That positive 33 is 33 AD. But remember, when we're crossing the BC AD line, we had to be careful of that. In this case, we'll have to add the number one there to compensate for that shift to 34 AD. And this we know to be true. There are no zero year, so it needs correction. Um, uh, 2300 minus 490 gives 1810. So from 34 AD, or to 34 AD, we would simply need to add 1810 years to complete the 2300 day count. And from 34 AD, adding 1810, we end up with 1844. And we can check it by, of course, it's right here, 1810 plus 490 is 2300. And that's the mystery. That's one part of the mystery that's solved. But the bigger part that we have, the bigger challenge we have as Adventists is to um, look, validate the date of October 22nd. So I'm going to skip over this here that proves the birth of Christ, that he was 30 years old at the time when he began his ministry, um, which is in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. He was about 30 years of age when he began his ministry, but we will pass that over. Um, just uh, Tiberius, this is Britannica Encyclopedia telling us about the, the birth of Christ. And here it is, and it says, Tiberius in full, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, or Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus, original name Tiberius Claudius Nero, born and died in such given years. He's the second Roman emperor who reigned from 14 A.D. to 37 A.D. He reigned throughout the life of Christ, the, you know, to the life of Christ's ministry. It says, in Second Roman Emperor, adopted son of Augustus, whose imperial institutions and imperial boundaries he sought to preserve. So I brought this out to show that we have another location point here that Tiberius Caesar, or Tiberius Caesar Augustus, was the, the Caesar that was ruling during the time when they said, you're not Caesar's friend. They said that to Pilate. Um, another Roman Empire, in, in, it says, in 1380, Tiberius' constitutional powers were renewed on equal terms with those of Augustus, making his succession inevitable as the elderly Augustus died in 14 AD. So he, Tiberius, you know, we, we have Julius Caesar Augustus, and then Tiberius. So we'll move from that. And, and I noted here, due to the illness of the elder Augustus, he adopted Father Tiberius, who was ruling the empire from 1280. And um, that's just a little history there. And I'll pass over this math because we've already seen that earlier. And we, this is a little more refinement, but in the interest of time, I'm going to leave the slide alone and come to 1844. Because we now want to validate October 22nd, 1844. The first thing we need to understand in using the biblical calendar is to locate the new moon. And the new moon of interest is the new moon on or after the vernal equinox. The new moon on or after vernal equinox. Vernal equinox comes between March 20th and 21st every year. The earth passes this point in space. And what do we mean by equinox? Equal days and equal nights. The earth gets to the point where it was at creation, where the days and the nights are equal equinox so um, in such a situation we get to the creation orbital momentum 
it lasts for a very short window of time, 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night, roughly speaking. They might be a few seconds apart. You may be 12 hours and one minute and 11 hours and 59 minutes, something along that line. But over the course of the day, you know, they meet that equilibrium point throughout that 24-hour cycle. So in, in 1844, and it would be helpful to see the, the new moon calendar for 1844. So here we have the new moon calendar for Portland, Maine, because the, the Adventists were in the East Coast, so we'll use the East Coast calendar. And I have it here, Portland, Maine, USA, 1844. You can get this at timeanddate.com. They have good calendar information there. And um, the Earth, the vernal equinox for 1844, Ver, the Earth was in vernal equinox, and notice vernal equinox, March 20th, 1844. I want you to note this middle column here that, that, that's in red. This got shifted a little when I copied it, but I pasted you have universal time, Atlantic time, Eastern time, Pacific Standard time. The Eastern time is what we're following. So it's this one that I'm boxing around. This is the Eastern time calendar here. And so the first number, the number to the left, is for the day. Then the middle number is for the hour. And then the far right number is a minute. So the day, the hour, and the minute. So as in 1844, the first number of the day is 20th. We're all here in March, okay? The year is March. The, the, year, the month is March. So we're just looking at the day. 1844, the day was March. The day was 20th of March. The hour was 6.53. 0653 is a.m. is 6.53 in the morning. It's just about sunrise. So it's about the, the break of day in 1844. Important to note that we need not just the vernal equinox, but we need the new moon. So we need to find out that when was the new moon in relation to the vernal equinox. Did the new moon occur before March 20th or after March 20th? And when we say the new moon, we're not speaking of the, the, um, the astronomical new moon, but the sighted moon. You know, we didn't have Hubble Telescope and, you know, European Space Agency, ESA, and all the other eyes in the sky to see the moon in its um, traverse across the sky. So they did not use the astronomical new moon that NASA uses today. They used the sighted moon. They had to literally see the moon in the sky. And there was, with experience, they knew, as we do now, when the new moon would be visible in the sky. There are mathematical formulas that tell us the orbital spin of the Earth. The Earth is pretty constant in its, in its rotation. That's why the day is pretty constant. You know, night plus day together, you get 24 hours, you know, with a few seconds, minutes behind. But speak, roughly speaking, or roundedly speaking, 24 hours. So there's some constants in nature that we can use to extrapolate our understanding. All right, so in 1844, just going back to this uh, vernal equinox, it occurred on March 20th at 6.53 a.m. You want to lock that number down. Note that number, March 20th at 6.53 a.m. We next need to find the new moon. The new moon um, for... 1844. To see, did it occur on or after March 20th? So, in 1844, here we have the new moon calendar, moon phases. Um, for March, remember, so here the moon, the new moon, the first column with the moon phase here, new moon is 18th March at 7.20 p.m. Important. 7.20 p.m., this is Roman calendar. We're using Gregorian calendar here. So they don't recognize the day change until, until midnight. But we respect the day change at sunset. 
And did I put the sunset calendar here? I hope I did. Yes. So here we have 1844 Vernal Equinox date time for Portland, Maine. We have the sunrise sunset calendar. Watch it now. Sun rose at 548 a.m. Sunset at 1757 p.m., which is 557 p.m. So go back to see. This is so very important, but we need all your focus here. So on March 18th, when it says the, the new moon occurred at 7.20 p.m., that was really March 19th on God's calendar. Because the sun, when was the sun set again? The sun was set by 5.57 p.m. By 6 p.m., the sun was already be, you know, below the horizon. So... This date they have as March 18th. On God's calendar, that would be equivalent of March 19th. Since we're, we're calibrating God's cal the Roman calendar to track with God's calendar. So we're on March 19th here. So that means it's darkness. The moon just became new. That's the astronomical new moon. We will not see that moon in the sky. Not until the next evening. Not until the following evening would we see the moon in the sky. So we're already at March 19th. And 18th, yeah, March 19th. So when we come around, we saw that the, the earth came into vernal equinox at 6.53 a.m. on March 20th. Very important to see. So... The night of March, so let me step back a minute. March 18th here at 7.20 p.m. is March 19th, biblically speaking. So the moon will not be seen until the next evening, which would be March 20th. The trouble we have is that the earth did not come into new moon, I mean into vernal equinox until 13 hours later, 6.53 a.m., so we cannot use the moon of March 20th. That new moon cannot be used because the earth was not yet in vernal equinox. Vernal equinox came at 6.53 a.m. that next morning, which would be March 21st on, on um, yeah, it would be March 20th, really, 6.53 a.m. March 20th on Roman time. But remember, God's day begins the night before, which is, on their calendar would still be March 19th, but we are calibrating for God's calendar. The moon would be, would be visible in the sky on March 20th. That moon came before the sighted moon of March 21st. So it means that we cannot use that date of March 20th to begin the count. This is where the Karaites, and all the Jewish people went off the tracks. They used the wrong new moon. So in, they end up with a month early. So what we have to do is to search for the next month. Whenever the moon, whenever the moon, whenever the moon comes before vernal equinox, we have a leap year. That means we have to intercalate, adding an extra 30 days to the month. So in such a year, you have a longer winter. The cherry blossoms would be late that year if they had cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. They didn't. And we have been so very precise with this. We've been able to make predictions when the cherry blossoms will be late or early using this very same metric here. Cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. So here, the next new moon that follows March 18th is, March 7, is April 17th. And that's the new moon of interest. So now, the new moon of April 17th is, is at 11.36 a.m. We need at, least, it, it, it need at least 16 hours in the sky for the moon to cross the horizon, the cross of crosses, you know, the earth with the sun, and then we see it in the sky that night. So April 17th, we will not see the moon in the sky that night. It's only... About six hours before sunset. Too, too short a notice for the moon to come up in the sky. So the moon is going to come up in the sky, not on April 18th, but the night of April 19th. 
And so that's when we find the first moon. And since we're not doing Passover, we're, we're just going to count months now, the new moon. So the first new moon is on April the 17th. The second new moon is on May 17th. The third new moon is on June 15th. The fourth new moon is on July 15th. The fifth new moon is on August 13th. The sixth new moon is on September the 12th. And the seventh new moon is on October the 11th. So this is important month. Since this is month number seven, we want to find now the first day of the seventh month and the tenth day of the seventh month. Well, 6.28 p.m. 6.28 p.m. Even by our standards today, we know that it's sunset. 6.28 p.m. October um, 11th. Right at sunset. Did I have the sunset calendar? Sunrise, sunset for that for... Um, let's see if it's on this slide. Mm, okay, I have it just for Passover. Let's see. Um, October 22nd. So, now I didn't have the sunrise sunset calendar, but it you we could guide it from the from the, the one of March, because they, they normally go just about the same as we know. We, we are all alive. We understand that you know, in, the, in the spring, the days are getting longer, and in the fall, they're getting shorter. So it's just going to be the exact opposite of what we see in the spring, winter going into spring, as we see in this fall going into the winter. Okay, so... Um, Disappointed I didn't put that one with the, the sunset calendar because that would have been beneficial for discussion here. Okay, so going back to the seventh new moon, which is here on October 11th, 6.28 p.m. Even if the sun, even if the sun were still in the sky at 6.28 p.m., it would be too young a moon to be visible that night. The moon is too young. We have to wait for at least 18 to 24 hours. Here we have it. 6.28 p.m. right at sunset. That's an astronomical new moon is what they're giving us. So the, the sighted moon would not be seen that night. And remember, October 11th at sunset would be October 12th. Just bear that in mind. So October 12th, we go over to the evening of October 12th, which is October 13th. So October 13th is when we'll see that sighted moon, and that would be the first day of the month. So let me validate that since I didn't bring my, my, um, the time of the sunrise sunset. Um, let me scroll down here because I have it worked out. Okay, I do have it here. All right, so, and I could read it directly from here, since you saw the graphic earlier. The seventh new moon from April 19th takes us to October 11th at 6.28 p.m. The moon is visible on October 13th, biblical time, which is in Roman time would be October 12th. This would be the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month. All we're doing now is to count 10 days inclusive, inclusive of October 13th and we'll end up October 22nd. Or if you're the first day of the seventh month and you need to get to the 10th day, you add nine more days. Either way, you're, count, you're taking the 10th of Tisri. So the 10th day of the first month Considering that the first day of the first, I mean, the 10th day of the seventh month, considering the first day is the 13th, the 10th day is 13 plus 9, which is, which is 22. Remember, there's no zero day. So the 13th is the first. 
day of the first of the seventh month. 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21, 22 is the tenth day of the seventh month. This is why the Seventh Day Adventists or the Adventists in 1844 observed October 22nd, not September 23rd. This has been such a best kept secret. And it has led at least 1.5 million people out of the church because they don't understand God's calendar. I computed all the other significant days for that year, such as Passover and all the other feast days for that year, but we don't have time to go through them. In the discussion, we perhaps can look back on them. Just want to give you a little view on the moon here. The full moon is seen on the left, and I have the title above it. Actually, to the right, we have the first quarter. Notice that the moon is illuminated from right to left, read it like reading the, the Hebrew writing. So the first quarter is the, the illuminated side is what is white. The dark side, of course, is the dark side. So we have the first quarter, which is from right to left now. Then the second quarter, which we call full moon. That means the, the face of the moon that is directed to the sun, the earth, it's fully illuminated. That's the full moon. The third quarter, the third quarter is now the same as three quarters. The third quarter of the moon is now illuminated, which we see half of the moon, on the, which is the left side of the moon is now illuminated. And we, of course, have, I, I said something incorrect. Let me correct myself. The first quarter is called the is illuminated. What should have been here is the, the full moon. Where the new moon is, I should have had the full moon. I'll fix that later. So going from right to left, we have the illuminated side of the moon, which is the right side. That's the first quarter. That's the first eight days of the month. And the moon goes into phase seven days thereafter. Each seven day thereafter, it goes into a new phase. So the the second quarter, which would be here, full moon, and I will put these in order. The second quarter, so one half of the moon is illuminated, that's the first quarter. The other half of the moon is illuminated, that's the second quarter. The third quarter is where one side of the moon is dark and the other side is lit, which the, the right side is dark and the left side is lit, that's the third quarter. And then the new month or the new moon is when the moon is dark, cannot be seen. And I'll put it here for the purpose of illustration. So first, the first quarter is the first phase of the moon. First, the second phase of the moon is the full moon, which yeah, it's not called second quarter. It's called full moon. The third phase of the moon is third quarter. And the, f- the fourth phase of the moon is the new moon so that's an easy way of seeing it all right so i want to show now this 457 date is defended by sunday keepers and we're going to conclude shortly give me a few more moments here 457 bc defended by sunday keepers this book is called creation centered in christ and it was written in the year 1896 and uh, Henry or Harry Grattan Guinness wrote this book. His life spanned from 1835 to 1910. You can read about him online, and there's a lot of good information about this man, Mr. Grattan Guinness. Here's his book, Creation Centered in Christ. I want to take, in the interest of time, I won't read all that I planned, but I need to, I need to start from the here, where I'm going to mark, that you can see. Uh, uh, actually, maybe here. There are two such edicts recorded in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, whose dates are the 7th and 20th years of reign of Artaxerxes. The journeys of Ezra and Nehemiah to Jerusalem connected with these edicts commenced in each case in the Passover month of Nisan. 
The date of the ascension of Artaxerxes is determined by the canon of Ptolemy and his seventh year, notice, his seventh year, by the calculations of Sir Isaac Newton. I'm picking up here now. Commenced after the midsummer of A.N. J.P. 4546 and the journey of Ezra to Jerusalem in the spring followed, following fell on the beginning of A.N. J.P. 4257 or in B.C. 457. Here he has it. B.C. 457. He continues down to where marking now. Sir, I, Sir Isaac Newton says of the 70 weeks as reckoned from B.C. 457, the 70 weeks of years are Jewish weeks ending with sabbatical years, which is very remarkable. Remarkable, Very interesting, sabbatical years. I don't have time to tell you about sabbatical and jubilee years in the midst of the week of years, but when we're doing another study on this topic, we can. Uh, move forward in his conclusion. Reckoning from the month of Nisan, B.C. 457, the Ezra Terminus, we find that the period in the 70 weeks, which extended to our Lord's death, resurrection, and ascension, was exactly 6,000 lunations, and thus answered to the 600 lunations, which in the corresponding 49 years jubilee period, extended to the entrance of the high priest within the veil on the great day of atonement in the year of jubilee. And I would encourage you to check out this book. It's actually an online book right now on Yahoo Books, and you can read it there online. Lastly, this is a Sunday keeper. This is written by a Sunday keeper, my friend, in 1896. So I want to read this last portion here from him. And I'm going to pick up from here. We're marking. Our tables in the second volume of this work show that the lunar phases in the year B.C. 457 coincided with the vernal equinox. The date of the true new moon, Jerusalem civil time, as shown in our tables, is March 25th, 8 hours 45 minutes. That of the vernal equinox, March 26th, 10 hours 34 minutes. And the lunar phases fell on the evening of March 26th. These dates are confirmed by the 2,300 years lunar cycle, extending from the new moon and vernal equinox of B.C. 457 to the new moon and vernal equinox, drumroll please, of A.D. 1844. This is by a non-Seventh-day Adventist source that they have validated this new moon and vernal equinox, as I tried to share with you earlier, and agreed with the conclusion that 1844 was indeed the day of judgment, October 22nd, as we understand it. Now, he didn't mention October 22nd here. It is sufficient just to note the year 1844. So, in concluding, I'll share these two paragraphs from Sister White. Um, yeah. Every man's work. This is great controversy. 482. Brother O'Neill mentioned it last night as well. Every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered the t with terrible exactness every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty in every secret sin, with every artful dissembling. Heaven sent warnings or reproofs, neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities, the influence exerted for good or for evil, with its far-reaching results, are all chronicled by the recording angel. The law of God is a standard by which the characters and the lives of men will be tested in the judgment. Says a wise man, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. The Apostle James admonished, admonishes his brethren, 
so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. I wish I had time to talk about this law of liberty that James wrote about. Most people think it's the Ten Commandments. I would encourage you to look more closely. You'll see that it is the Torah. It is the statutes, judgments, and commandments. And we'll talk about that another time. Finally, she says, those who in the judgment are accounted worthy will have a part in the resurrection of the just. Jesus said, they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead are equal unto the angels and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. And again, he declares that they that have gone, done good rather, they that have done good shall come forth unto the resurrection of life. The righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment at which they are accounted worthy of the resurrection of life. Hence, they will not be pre present in person at the tribunal when their records are examined and their cases decided. So I wanted to conclude at this point by saying that we have come to a very important terminus point. And this indeed is the judgment hour of Christ, the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And every year, he officiates in, in this capacity as high priest, and as we discussed last night, to blot out, blot out transgressions, uh, blot out our sins that are, we have been forgiven of. And there's a final blotting out that will cu culminate in what is called the executed day of judgment, judgment upon the living when his <laughs> wrath commences on one day in our future, and I believe near future, God is going to do a work of cleansing on earth. Now, there are two judgments in the, in the calendar. There's a judgment at Passover and a judgment at Atonement. The judgment at Passover was for the whole house of Israel, for the whole body of believers. The judgment of Passover is upon the first fruits. So you can see where we are, that the Passover judgment, and also in another way to look at it, the Passover judgment is the beginning of the harvest. And the, the atonement judgment is the end of the harvest at the end of which we have tabernacles, the end of the year. So there are two judgments, two cleansings, first in the church and then in the world. The judgment is set and the books are opened. How shall we stand in that great day? And it is my prayer that we will all stand in the righteousness of Christ. And I thought I had it here and I'm not seeing it. All right, so we'll close at this point and um, continue in our Day of Atonement spiritual exercises. Loving Father, we thank you for the time we spent looking into your word and needing to give every man an answer and to have the assurance in our hearts of how to meet you in your office hours on your appointed occasions. And as we pause to discuss one with another, may we not forget the importance of what is going on in the heavenly places right now, the courts above, and ask that you may wash us with hyssop, that we shall be whiter than snow. Purify our hearts, that we might learn to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And to the end, that we might hear the well done from your lips, to enter into the joys of our Lord, and we thank you and confess our sins in his name. Amen. We will have discussion after the song.
Amen. All right, so we will open the lines at this time for discussion and uh, request that you monitor your background noises so we can have a good experience here. Go ahead. That that source on the uh, 1844. What makes uh, what makes that source unique, and um, what what church was that, and what's that church's position today? I I don't know their position today, but I can find the the source. And, moment here. I should have, I was hurrying for time. And um, actually, there, there's still a Sunday keeping communion until today. And uh, the creation sent in Christ. Let's see. Um, bring him up here. All right. So it says there, um, he was the great evangelist of the evangelical awakening and preacher preaching during the Usler revival. Um, I'd have to go back to Wikipedia to see exactly which church is he was, which church it was from the Evangelical Awakening. But I know he's I know he was not Seventh Adventist. That was the first thing I checked for. He was Seventh Adventist and he wasn't. So um, then I I found felt very grateful. Uh, this man was so good in his scholarship. He even predicted. Now he died. In 1910, he predicted that the Jews would be in Jerusalem by 1948. He said, or, or that Jerusalem would be a Jewish state by 1948. He had very precise um, mappings of the, with calendar details. And so if you check out his book, which is an online book now, given it's age. Uh, he has a lot of good information, good content. How, how did he come up with that? Um, using some calendar permutations. I, I don't know. The, the, uh, I didn't spend time studying that part of the mystery because it wasn't that important to me. I see a lot of people using all sorts of methods and coming up with 1948. Yeah. From this, I a number of verses, number of words from one verse to another, and uh, they... So here it comes out, 1948. And, you know, the 2520, I think, the 2520 people, they have some methods that they use to identify 19... No, they, I think they use 911 is what they, they come up with, 2001. Okay. So, yeah, I didn't spend time on that one. Okay, so what makes this position unique? Uh, what makes it... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. For me, what makes it unique is that he's a Sunday keeper and he recognizes that the 2,300 days terminated in 1844, which is so different yeah. because most Sunday keepers, they agree that the 2,300, the prophecy started, the seventh week started in 457 B.C. and they get to, and they, they take six to nine weeks and they scrape up the 70 weeks and throw it 2,000 years down the road. And say, so, see, we're waiting for a 70 week, you know, the seven year tribulation that's still ahead of us. So this is what is unique about Mr. Guinness's work, is that he didn't fall for that. So most of them moved the last week or the last half of the, of the last week, and they're still yeah, waiting for yeah. an event. Right. Um, has there been anyone who said a different day than 44, like 43 or 50? Yes. Or? Yeah, there are Adventists who, and still some Adventists today, who still embrace that um, 
the 2300 days terminated actually in 1843 and not 1844. And there, there's a view out there um, pushing that because they see 458 as the year. And a lot of history books tell you that that's 458. But as I demonstrated earlier, um, they're using the calculator and understanding the difference between ascension and renal years, um, these are important differences and not being careful. I remember I was challenged, I presented the subject and I was challenged to, to show the Adventist position and show why. Because even you go to the date, you can't just use a number. You can't just say, okay, the new moon was on, on March 20th. And see, vernal equinox came March 18th and new moon was on March 20th. You need to know that new moon was March 20th at 6.53 in the morning. And the new moon became new at 6 p.m. that night. So that's not the same. You're not dealing with the equinox here. The, the, the equinox is still 13 hours away. So you know, what, there are what, some what Adventists the time going on. The, the, the time, time of the new moon is when the sun sets. Yeah. yeah, how is that affecting what you just said? It needs to, you need to know that 659, for example. Okay, because the new, okay, let's say equinox begins at 6 a.m. and the new moon started at 6 p.m. You cannot say, oh, the new moon at 6 p.m. last night was the new moon that marked the new month. There was no sighted moon in the sky. Okay. You have to wait for the new moon that is governed by that equinox. And so you have so to go skip saying. one whole month. So some people are just, you mean you wait for the actual new moon at the, at the time where it's visible versus choosing a moon. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. We've seen this. We've seen this over and again. And um, I didn't check the calendar this year, but maybe I could do that right now because I believe there might be some people who are off. I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't check the calendar to see if, um, and I could just simply ask Google Jewish holidays for 2019, and we can validate easily. Holy days, Jewish holy days for 2019, and uh, maybe something will come up. I should have well, asked it for... Jewish holidays for 2019. And I have a little table that comes up here for... It's so small, I'm not seeing it here. So, um, 17, oh, it went to 17, 2018. I asked 2019. So, 2019, April, okay, October 2019. Let's see if that will be visible. Uh, that's, that's uh, my computer says to stay away from that site. So it's 2019 Jewish holidays calendar. Okay, maybe this one will come up, and it will show if there are others. So, all right. So we have here on September, October. So they 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 are correct. Yom Kippur is in September, in October 9th here. Yeah, so their calendar is correct. Every, ever so often, like every three or four years, they, they get off track because they use the new moon that's closest to the vernal equinox rather than on or after the vernal equinox. And in 1844, such was the case. They used the moon that was closest which was the moon of April uh, of March 19th, and they needed to have used the moon of April 18th. And so uh, the Karaites now they they uh, they use the moon closest to the vernal equinox, not on or after, right? Correct. Correct. So when you when you put the confidence in what the Karaites say, and then they turn around and deny 
1844, October 22nd, then that causes a lot of Adventists to lose hope or fall out or lose their faith. Yep. Yep, it's a huge letdown. Huge letdown. Mm-hmm. All right, thanks. Amen. Any other? Hopefully this was enlightening to all of us. Are there any other comments or questions or such? Okay. Well, I know it's a day for prayer and self-examination, so I won't interrupt that. We just wanted to at least have this fellowship and help people to get on the right track with the calendar because... Most Adventists and Davidian Adventists do not know where to find themselves with a calendar and how to locate each festival without looking on somebody's calendar that they published. So with this knowledge, we can actually um, validate whether or not we're seeing the correct information. And this is what happened with those who teach a September 23rd um, event, they cannot for sure determine the calendar. They're just going by what they see, by what someone published. And actually, I will put this up here on the screen since this is a published calendar, the Jewish calendar for 1844, and let me get to the one for the fall. Where did it go? September. Why is it not turning? Oh, I see. <laughs> I was wondering why. So here, this is the, the September 1844 Jewish calendar. I have a link on it, so it can easily be pulled up. And you can see that they have it here, the 10th of Tishri. It was on 23rd September. Yom Kippur. But we said it was the 22nd of October. And this is what that Robert Saunders guy did. He said, ha, huh, the Adventists don't have a, a shoe to, you know, they don't have a leg to stand on here. Tenth of history. And he gets all sorts of witnesses to say, yeah, that was the 10th of history. September 23rd. And I have it right here. But that's a mistake. They didn't understand to use the equinox, or they didn't respect the use of the equinox. And that's what, where we, we have it. So, all right. Yeah. Any other comments or questions from anyone else before we conclude today's program? All right, so if there's nothing else, I will just close the room with one of these. What is it? Okay. Computers work slowly. Okay, everybody. Well, have a good and blessed rest of holy time. We look forward to meeting again on the on the fourteenth day the fifteenth day of the seventh month. That would be the fourteenth of October. Beginning Tabernacles to the twenty first. Whoa.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Shalom.